You know, it is Vision Sunday, and this is a Vision Sunday unlike any that we've had before because all the things are unlike anything <laughs> we've had before. We're getting good at just rolling with things, aren't we? We're like pros at this now. It's awesome. That's what I've decided. Um, but I just want to share a little bit of the vision I believe that God has been developing in us. It isn't anything that's going to like shock you because these are things that we have been talking about. But there is such a gift in being able to see more clearly. I think of all that God is doing that we have a sense of perhaps, or maybe you see in your life, but I don't know because I have a different perspective. I think of just how every letter up here represents a child and a home and a family. It's so much bigger than what we see as we give. And a story like the Jamesons is just one aspect of how God is working and how he is moving. And I love how we get to kind of have glimpses into that. Even today, as we rolled into church, we got here not as early as we normally would, but early, and the fog was just lifting, and you can see the mountains, and you can see beyond. We can, we can get socked in sometimes with the weather, or just with our perspective, because it can be overwhelming. We focus down, and today what I want to do, and encourage you to do along with me, is let's lift our eyes. Let's lift our eyes. Let's see and ask God to show us what he sees so that we can see more clearly. And actually, we have prayed a few times already, but I'm going to go ahead and pray again. I just want to invite you to join me. If you're online, join along with me, and I'm praying that God would allow us to see from his perspective. So God, that is our prayer, and that's our prayer. You said that if we need wisdom to ask you, and you will give it to us. And we ask that by your spirit, counselor, comforter, advocate, advisor, Holy Spirit, would you help us to see more clearly, open our eyes to see from your perspective, God, what you are doing in our lives and in this community, what you're doing in our city and across our nation, what you're doing across this globe today. We know that nothing is messing with your plan, that your plans and your purposes prevail. And I pray, God, that you would help us to just get a, a better revelation of that, a glimpse of it, because we need it. God, we pray that you would stir us by your spirit, that you would allow that faith on the inside of us to grow as we see what you're doing. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Everything has shifted a little bit. This is not new news to any of you. Um, we have talked about or you've heard talk about like a new normal. There is no questioning that we have walked into something of a new era. Things have changed in just the world around us. Things have shifted in the church, and it is a new day. And we have been talking about this a little bit here and there over the last couple of years as we've talked about what it looks like to be exiles living in a new land, in an unfamiliar place. Many of you weren't born in Canada, or if you were, maybe your parents weren't. Canada is full of people who have come to this land, but have come from a different place, different customs, different food, different language, and would understand what it looks like to show up in a place and for it to be unfamiliar. And God's word is full of the story of his people who were so often exiled. They lived as exiles in an unfamiliar place, in a, a place that they didn't understand that they had to kind of adapt to. And as I'm reading God's word, we, we always focus on Jesus as we should. And next week, we are going to go back into our study, um, the life and times of Jesus Christ. We've been going through the, the book of John, and we'll be there next week. But at the same time, I've been so drawn to the Old Testament and the story of what God is doing from the very beginning since creation, and also looking at the book of Revelation, what we have to look forward to, the hope that is ahead. And I've always been drawn to some of the prophets, especially Isaiah. He's like my, my guy. I love Isaiah. Um, but last year, I read a book about the prophet Jeremiah. I read a book by Eugene Peterson called, um, uh, oh gosh, Running with the Horses. Running with the Horses. I was going to say runs with the horses, as in like dances with wolves or something. It got shifted in my head. Running with the horses. And so it was this, it's basically an overview of Jeremiah. And as so much of the Bible, 
um, has come to life for me in this last season. I read it, and I just see the through lines of what God did and what he's doing today. I'm so drawn to that because, like I said, I can so often be narrow-minded. I just see the challenges in front of us and what is going on right here. And so I've been drawn to the long story, what God has done in the past, what he did through his people in the Old Testament. And Jeremiah is this, um, this guy who inspires me so much. He started his ministry when he was really young, really, really young. And if you read it, you know that the people in his day didn't pay a whole lot of attention to him. They didn't hold a lot of value for his words. He was downloading what God was saying to him. And he was boldly saying that to the people. And some of what he said was encouraging, and some of it was super convicting and super challenging. And it needed to be, because when we look at the story of God's people, they were all over the place. They had so many warnings from different prophets, and they so often ignored it, or they, they carried on with what they were doing, or they would change for a little while, and then they'd go back to their old ways. And so I want to share, if you have a Bible, if you want to go to Jeremiah 29, I'm going to read that in just a minute. I'm probably not going where you think I'm going, but we'll go to Jeremiah chapter 29 in a minute. But to kind of set this up as it is a bit of a vision message today, I want to remind you, if you've been with us for a little while, that as a church family, we have practiced choosing a word, a scripture, something to frame our year for a few years. And that has been a practice that kind of helps us align around a vision or what God is saying for the moment. And if you remember in 2020, as we rolled into 2020 with just so much excitement about a new decade ahead, God had um, given me a dream a few months before 2020. And I don't dream a whole lot of dreams or have a whole lot of visions. It's not like that was just commonplace. It was a big deal. But he gave me this dream, and I'll just refresh your memory, or maybe tell you for the first time if you're new around here, where I walked out of my house, and it was my house. It looked like my street. But as I walked out of the house, I could see that there was no development around us. There was no houses. It was just lots. It was um, like a neighborhood that was about to be built. And that was familiar to us because years before when we moved into our house, we're in Willoughby, which is, has changed so much in the last few years. But when we moved in, there was nothing across the street. There weren't any homes there. So I had this dream where I walked outside and I could see a neighborhood that was ready to be built, but nothing was there. There was cul-de-sacs that were paved and it was like the water was in and the things that needed to be like under the ground and I'm not an expert in all of this, but it was there. I had a sense that it was ready, you know, when there's pipes sticking out in the different plots of land. It was all mapped out and it was ready for development. And as I looked, I could hear the sound of construction coming in. I could hear and feel just the rumble of trucks coming, knowing that development was coming. And that was kind of a new beginning for us as a church because I was new to, to leading and that um, transition had happened and been finalized in 2019. A lot of change and a lot of transition had already happened for us as a church family. And so as we went into 2020, there was just such a real sense that God was doing something new. Now, we know he's always doing a new thing, but we knew that things were shifting and changing, and we weren't sure what it was going to look like. We felt convicted about being surrendered and being ready to roll with whatever God had for us. And so when we had Vision Sunday in 2020, we declared that 2020 was a Genesis year, that God was doing a new thing. That scripture, Psalm 51, that says, create in me a clean heart, O God. Uh, the message paraphrase had worded it by saying, shape a Genesis week out of the chaos of my life. That was our prayer. That was our posture. That was our expectation that 2020 would be new. A Genesis year. God was doing something. We could see he kind of had it mapped out for us. We had an idea as a leadership of what that might look like. But we were, we were ready for how he would lead us. And like I said, I just had this sense that building was coming in, construction was coming. But obviously, we had no idea what was ahead for us in 2020. And then as we went into lockdown and we moved our gathering online, 
God made other things clear in our time where we were at home, where all of a sudden uh, we weren't as, as frantically busy as we once were. We were at home. That was weird for us as a family to be home so much. And I had this revelation, which many people already had, but it took Angela a while to catch up, that my house was surrounded by people. There were neighbors that lived all around me that I had not paid attention to, that I'd been too busy doing ministry to really focus on. And God broke my heart for our neighborhood, for where he had put us, because my eyes were opened. I could see clearly that I was surrounded by his children, these people that I, I didn't know. And there was a conviction to be a, a faithful presence in my neighborhood. And God began to stir in us this desire as a church to be planted in, rooted in our neighborhoods. We've had this vision of a church that is like a table spread across the valley, a table spread across the lower mainland and the valley and beyond, a table where people could find welcome and home and community and belonging. They could find hope in Jesus ultimately. We had this vision of being Relate Church where we were pulling up the tables, sorry, pulling up the chairs in creative ways, allowing people to find relationship. And that wasn't just about the people who were coming to a building. We had literally left the building. And now God developed that idea of being in relationship, in community, to a place where we could see that happening in neighborhoods. Um, in, in 2021, which we didn't put a word over, 2021 kind of felt like an extension in a lot of ways of 2020. And maybe 2022 kind of feels like another extension of 2020. But in 2021, some of those things that God was showing us were, were clearer, more refined. And so in September, um, in the fall of last year, we talked about this, this vision that we would see it here as it is in heaven, in our neighborhoods, in our communities. And we um, kind of recalibrated our mission statement, saying that we are God's growing family, practicing kingdom life for the renewal of our city. And if there was a word that I'd put over this season that we're walking into that I expect to see God developing in us and in his church, because it's not just about Relate Church, but we're responsible for what he's given us, the word that I see God developing is renewal. Renew, renewal, a renewal in us. It's a continuation of that new thing he's doing and a renewal in our city. And I believe that 2022 will be marked by renewal. That word, by the way, in Hebrew is kadash. It's a beautiful, refreshing word. It speaks about making something new, refurbishing it, re restoring it, rebuilding it. It speaks of making something better than it was before. It is a word that as I considered what it means, um, just generally, I think most of us only use the word renew if we're like renewing a mortgage um, or like renewing a loan. I don't know. I, I think it's, it's maybe a bit of a church word because we know that it means to make something new. And, and let's focus on that because it, it is to, to make something new, to rebuild. This word in Hebrew um, it usually refers to the work that God is doing as he is making things new. And even just that, that prefix, if we think about newness, um, the prefix re means to do it again. To do it again and again and again. And that is what God does. Isaiah prophesied that God was doing something new, that he was making a way through the wilderness. Isaiah 43 verse 19 says, see, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The psalmist wrote that God's spirit is what creates life and renews the earth. Psalm 104.30 says, when you give them your breath, life is created and you renew the face of the earth. God does this. He makes things new. We see it every morning. We see it every spring. I was just telling somebody that in my mind, spring is next week. It's here. It's coming. He's going to do the thing. I don't know, his, I don't know the timing, but he, he makes it new again. David asked God to renew and to restore that right spirit within him, that creating that only God can do. Psalm 51, create in me a pure heart, God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. And Jeremiah, as I was reading about Jeremiah, 
and his influence and his direction that God gave him to give to the people. As I was reading through Jeremiah 29, it settled in me, as sometimes God's word does, that this was a word for us today as well. Jeremiah, he prophesied to God's people that there would be renewal. Even as he brought like a fiery, convicting word from God telling them to change, he prophesied that God would do a new thing. He was the one that said that God was going to give his people a new covenant, that it would be new, that he would write it on their hearts. And this is what we experience today. That's the covenant that we live under today, where God has written his law on our hearts, where we feel his conviction by the Spirit, where we're not necessarily following a long list of his law. That, that is what it looked like, but now it's within us. He said that that was going to happen. And he spoke to this bunch of exiles who had been moved from their city. They'd been taken out of what was familiar to them. Um, what had happened was that the Babylonians had captured Jerusalem. That's where they lived. And it was basically kind of like an extended takeover where they came in and they captured the city. And what they did is they removed all the people who had influence in the city. They took them away. They deported them to Babylon. So uh, the shop owners, the, the politicians, the, the leaders, anybody who was in a place of influence or a place of power, they removed them from Jerusalem and they took them to Babylon. And for some reason, Jeremiah got left behind. I told you that they didn't pay a whole lot of attention to them, and I guess to him, I guess they didn't think he was that influential. He got left behind in Jerusalem. So he writes a letter to the exiles, these people who have been living in a place that is unfamiliar to them. And as we just think about what that would feel like or look like, as I read it and I, I meditate on it, so much of it feels familiar. There was this group of people. They were God's people. They had a promise from God. They had a relationship with him. And they were in a place where they didn't know who they were surrounded by and the people that they were surrounded by they didn't especially like. They were taken from what was comfortable and routine, from, from what their preferences were perhaps, and they were brought to a new place where everything had changed, where things would feel unstable and unsecure, where the landmarks had changed and the customs were different. And, and they complained. And we always look at the people and we think, what is your problem? Like, obviously, just get in line, listen to God. But you know, just as I do, that we would do the exact same thing. And in fact, maybe we are. Um, they, were, they complained that they weren't where they were supposed to be, that this isn't how it's supposed to be, that this isn't God's will for them. And they actually had some religious leaders, some prophets, who were stirring the pot, who said that they were hearing from God and they were saying, don't worry about it. I'm totally paraphrasing. But they were basically saying, don't worry about it. You're going to go back. This isn't going to last long. It, it's not right. They stirred the discontent within the people. And they spoke into it, telling them that just hold on. It's not going to last too long and you're going to go back. And so as you can imagine, if you're in a place that you'd rather not be in and you're following customs that you'd rather not uh, follow... And you have a government, perhaps, making decisions that you aren't totally sure about. And you kind of want to go back to what was. You're longing, appropriately, for what was. And the people you knew, and the group you hung out with, and the way you did church, or temple, or whatever. You're longing for what that was. And then you have people who are saying, uh, just hold on. Just hold on. You're going to go back. That it would be challenging, perhaps, to put some roots down. And they didn't. They were just kind of circling, waiting for the day when they would be rescued and they could go back. And in this climate and at this time, Jeremiah writes these words. Jeremiah chapter 29, I'm going to start in verse 4. This is his letter to the exiles. For some reason, I bought the fattest Bible I could find today. Um, so it's heavy and this is good for me. Jeremiah 29 verse 4. Jeremiah's words to the people. He says, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says to all the captives he has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. Build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food they produce. Marry 
and have children. Then find spouses for them so that you may have many grandchildren. Multiply, do not dwindle away. And work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says. Do not let your prophets and fortune tellers who were with you in the land of Babylon trick you. Do not listen to their dreams because they are telling you lies in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. This is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon for 70 years. I'm not saying this is the promise for us. But then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised, and I will bring you home again, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity, and I will restore your fortunes. I will gather you out of the nations where I sent you, and I will bring you home again to your land. And he goes on from there. But what I want to point out here is that as I read this, some of these words just jumped out and like settled in my mind, in my heart, and my spirit. This letter to the exiles, it has Jeremiah inspired by God, led by God, to tell the people that in this place where you live, where you, you shouldn't necessarily, this shouldn't have happened, it's not like this is good, but you are here. This is, he says, the land that I've called you to. As you're here, he, he says, build, build here. He says, build homes. And as I read that, I hear God's words to them saying, build and, and plan to stay that we're not camping, we're not just circling here. This is where you live. Put some structure in place, establish some rhythms, build connections, dig some foundations, put some roots down, start building, build right here. This is the land where you live. Develop the best environment that you can with what you have where you are right there today. Build here, he says. And then he goes on and he says plant. Plant gardens. Plant gardens and eat the food that they produce. I hear him saying, learn the soil right here in this new place. Figure out what it takes to grow something here in this climate, in this environment, with this dirt. Get your hands dirty. Put some seed in the ground. Make some investments here. Think long term because nobody plants a garden and does that back-breaking work unless you're committed to the land where you live. To that place. It's a, a posture of anytime you, you plant seed, there's an expectation that I'm invested here, that I'm going to see some fruit come out of it. And he says, eat, eat it, eat the food that they produce. So he speaks of cultivating, of owning the land, of being there, of moving with the seasons of that land. And as I think about that, as I read that, I think of just what this last season has looked like. And maybe it has been a fallow year. There's a time where we, we see in, in, and again, I'm not an expert in this. I am not a farmer. But I know that there can be um, a benefit to a time when you just wait, where the land lies fallow, where there's not a whole lot happening, that it actually can bring enriching to the soil. And maybe it has felt like it's been a fallow season for you where you haven't seen any production, where maybe you haven't put any seed in the ground. Maybe it's been a season of, of um, cutting back, of trimming things, of pruning. Perhaps that's what it looks like and has looked like. And the thing about God and how he works is that all of that he can cause to work together for good. But he's telling them, this is where you are. This is the land that I've called you to. Put some seed in the ground. And then as it produces fruit, eat it. Enjoy it. Live life. Celebrate. Do what you can with what you have. Be productive here. The challenge or the conviction would be that we don't just wait for somebody else to fix it or to take us back to what was. That we don't just sit by and, and kind of hold, hold on, hold on to the seed, hold on to the investment thinking, I'm just going to wait until things look better. And hey, I feel this so often. I'm just going to wait until things make more sense. I'm just going to hold back. 
I believe that just as God was speaking at this time, that he's speaking to us and he's saying, this is the new thing. You're in a new place. This is where you live. I've called you here. I am here. Build houses, plant some seeds, invest, invest, put some stuff in the ground. And as you do, enjoy this experience right here. It doesn't look like it once did. It might not be the preference of the, of the land that you would love to live in and produce in, but this is what we have, and God is here. Yeah. He goes on to say marry and have children, and if that is a word for you, go ahead and do that. <laughs> but it speaks beyond just the obvious. It speaks of multiplication. Yeah. Yeah. It speaks of relationship, of connection. Find somebody to marry. Like, get, Find somebody, join your life with them, be in community, get connected, and think generationally, multiply. Think about what we're passing on today, what we're doing today that will be passed on to the next generation and the next generation. Because again, when there's a temptation to just hold on and wait this out, sit this one out, we're not thinking about what we're teaching our kids and what will get passed on to the next generation. But God is always thinking about that. He always has his mind on generations, on legacy. And Jeremiah says, start multiplying right here. Don't wait, do it here. Practice right here what you wanna pass on. He goes on to say, work for the peace and prosperity of this city. Pray for it, pray for it. Because what happens in your city, in your neighborhood, in your community is what happens to you. You live there. And again, as I read this, I think of just how we, as exiles, as, as people, as the people of God, who know that we are in this world, but we're not of this world, we carry God's kingdom and that kingdom culture, this world is not our home, and yet it is today right here, this is where we live, that's where our address is, he's put us in this place for a reason, this is our land, these are our people. And I feel that challenge to look at the people around us and see them not as us and them, but they are God's children. God has called us to love and serve and to practice what it is to be kingdom people right in the neighborhood where we live. Be here. Pray for your city. This is what we've been doing over the last few days is we're praying and fasting. We're praying for our city and we're praying for our nation and we're praying for uh, the world. And as Canadians, we look at what's going on and I just think it's part of our nature as humans to um, love the decisions that are made that are in alignment with what we believe and to criticize the ones that are made that are not in alignment with what we believe. But ultimately, these are our people. That is my government. These are our leaders. I need to pray for them. I need to pray for them. Pray, yes, for change, that God would have his way. And at the same time, pray. I love, Tracy, as you shared, that you're praying for, for the people that it would be easy to just be frustrated with. But we pray for the people around us. And God tells us to do that, that we would pray for the peace and prosperity of the city that we live in that we'd pray for and we'd contend for. And really, this is about moving from consuming. What are you going to do for me? What have you got for me? How is this going to improve my life? Consuming to contending. What am I bringing? What can I do? How can I serve? How can I pray? God, show me what you see so that I can live that out in this world. The shalom. Pray for the, the welfare, some translations say. That speaks of shalom. Pray that it would be well where we live because we live there. Because we're here. Take ownership of what's going on. Basically, Jeremiah is telling God's people, be here. Be here. You're already here. Now, be here. Show up. Make yourself at home. Not according to their terms, but according to God's terms. This is his direction. And ultimately, this... Um, this letter that he wrote and this word from God is about where we focus. On a Sunday, that's about focusing, vision, where are we going? It's about where we focus. Will we focus on, and this is our daily decision, direct our attention on what is wrong, what's wrong, what we miss, what we long for, or what is right here in front of us? 
what is God doing? What is he asking of us? How is he leading us? How can I be here, show up, pray, serve, love today? This is how Eugene Peterson wrote it. He writes that we can respond like this, and these words are just powerful, so I'm just going to quote him. He said, we can make the decision to say this, I will do my best with what is here. Far more important than the climate of this place, the economics of this place, the neighbors in this place, is the God of this place. God is here with me. What I am experiencing right now is on ground that was created by him and with people whom he loves. It is just as possible to live out the will of God here as any place else. I am full of fear. I don't know my way around. I have much to learn. I'm not sure I can make it, but I had feelings like that back in Jerusalem. Change is hard. Developing intimacy among strangers is a risk. Building relationships in unfamiliar and hostile surroundings is difficult. But if that is what it means to be alive and human, I will do it. It's powerful. It's about moving from consuming to contending. And that is God's desire. It's his plan for us. We know that God is making things new. That he is the one who renews. It is what he does. It is his work. Renewal is God's plan for this earth. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. Things are being made new. Renewal is God's plan for us, and it is his, his plan for this earth, and so it is our mission. That's what we're called to do. We get to be conduits of his presence. We get to be cultivators of his presence. What a privilege that is. It's such a, a responsibility, and it's such an honor that he would do what he wants to do in this land in us and through us. And so as we take on this year, 2022, as God's growing family, his growing family and friends, like I know it can feel like it's a shrinking family. (laughs) There's so much we don't see. There's so many that one day we'll know the stories. God is building his church. His plan hasn't changed. He's faithful. We are God's growing family. We'll do whatever we can to make space for others to come into the family, to know belonging, to find Jesus. And we're practicing kingdom life. We call it practicing and we talk about practicing because all of us are on a journey. We're, we're, we're growing and being changed and shaped into more and more of the image of Jesus, who Jesus is. That takes practice and it takes challenge and it takes pruning, and it takes hardship, because it's only through the challenges that we discover what's on the inside, what's really there. So we're practicing together, and we're doing it for the renewal of this city, because that's God's heart. That's his heart, that everyone would be renewed, that they know salvation, that they know Jesus, that they know hope. Every, everyone that this earth that he's created with such intentionality would reflect his goodness. He's renewing things and he does it through us. So I want to share just as I have been um, challenged in this last season, that if perhaps you have just been waiting a little bit, holding back a little bit, And maybe you haven't. I know so many stories of so many of you who are following God and you're making bold moves and you're doing faithfully what he's asked you to do. But if maybe you've kind of just thought, you'll sit this out, I'm just going to wait and see how things go. And maybe I'll I'll build, I'll, I'll start getting those plans moving when things are a little bit more settled. Or maybe if you have um, been distracted Your habits have changed. You've kind of pulled back. I want to encourage you that today is a day for building, for investing, for planting. And I don't know what that looks like for you. I know what it means for me. I have a pretty clear idea of what that means for me. As a church, over this next year, I am confident that God is and will continue to give us creative ideas to serve our neighborhoods, to show up and love people well, 
that restrictions can't hold back the power of God's church, which is just an army of people who are motivated to love others. And he'll give us those creative ideas that we need. And as he does, would you move and do what he asks us to do and be quickly obedient and, and let him lead us, let him renew you and then bring that to the world around us. You know, Jeremiah 30, he goes on and he says that the city would be rebuilt and the city would be built on its ruins. And we can look around and feel like we see ruins. We see deconstruction. We see things which don't look like they once did. We can look around and we can just see things that feel like it isn't right and this isn't how it should be. But God said that he was going to rebuild the city and he was going to do it right on top of the ruins. And that is what God does. He takes all the broken and scattered pieces, the things that do not make sense, what we call the end, brokenness, and he changes it. He transforms it to bring glory to him. That's what he does. There is nothing that is too much for him that he can't work in it, that he can't work through it. He renews, he renews, and he renews. And he does it again and again and again. I can't wait to see what he's going to do this year. Yeah. I'm full of expectation and anticipation. I am not who I was last year. He's changing us. I just want to pray for you. And I'm going to pray that for you and your sphere of influence in your home and your family and your relationships, that he's going to show you what that looks like. And don't listen to me. Go ahead and listen to him. If he's stirring that in you and if he's bringing out those, those thoughts and those visions in you, and I'm going to pray that he does, that you then have something to work with and move with. So would you let me pray for you? If you're at home and joining would you just pray with us? You're just as much with us. I want to pray with you as well. God, we thank you for your word. Thank you for this incredible word of God that is full of stories that show us your faithfulness. We thank you, God, for how you've led us here faithfully. And we trust and we know that you will lead us from here. God, I pray that you, by your spirit, would be speaking to each person. God, that you would be developing a greater vision, a clearer vision, a revelation of who you are and what you're doing. God, I pray that we would be a church that is just so honored to be filled with your spirit, so thankful to be marked as your children. God, that we wouldn't hold back and we wouldn't wait. God, that we wouldn't sit anything out, but God, that we would move as you ask us to we would act as you lead us to. God, before we take another day on or a week, the year ahead, I ask that you would convict us where we need it, where there's things that we need to let go of, change, repent of. God, we say, look at our heart. We welcome you in. Look at our heart, God. Create in us a clean heart. God, renew a bright spirit within us. Don't cast us out of your presence, God. Stay close to us. We need you with us. Restore to us the joy of our salvation. We thank you for the joy that comes with knowing you and following you. Renew in us, God, a right spirit. We thank you that you are Lord Jesus. You have done the work. You have paid the price for each one of us. And God, I pray that as we surrender our lives from this year to you, that you would create in us and through our lives what only you can. God, build your church. Build each and every person. Help us to see more clearly what is happening beyond what is obvious. And God, I pray that this year would be marked by renewal in our church, in our lives, in our homes. God, in this city, because we live here, I pray that there would be peace and prosperity in our cities and our neighborhoods, that your shalom would be here, that it would be right here in this city as it is in, in heaven. I pray your blessing on every life and every home. 